quantum computing just took another leap toward your organization. Hey Mike, so there's some chatter coming from China regarding uh, quantum technology. Yeah, this is uh, this is pretty interesting, right? As we kind of cast our eyes into the future and think about those disruptive things that are poised uh, just over the horizon. Quantum computing certainly seems to be, you know, one of the larger ones there on the horizon. And, and for those who might not be, you know, uh, read up on this, um, quantum computing is really uh, the process of using quantum, you know, physics, uh, quantum phenomenon, such as superpositioning and entanglement to perform uh, computation. And this uh, allows for computers to represent uh, qubits, not necessarily binary, you know, one or zero, but be able to be zero, one, or both simultaneously, which opens up uh, some fairly uh, incredible uh, advances to computing. The most commonly cited example is the ability to factor large prime numbers at incredible speeds, speeds really that can't be touched um, in other computing platforms today. Unfortunately, large prime factor numbering underlies a lot of these security uh, mechanisms that we have used traditionally to secure data in transit, um, you know, and other aspects of, you know, the information security uh, practitioner's arsenal. So um, about a year or so ago, um, Google actually made an announcement that they had reached quantum supremacy, where they had a quantum computer that could outperform a traditional computer at the same, for the same problem. Now China has joined that rank, uh, those ranks. And what's interesting is that the, the Chinese breakthrough happened with a fundamentally different type of architecture than the one used by Google. So now what we've seen is multiple valid uh, quantum computing approaches, which have been demonstrated to outperform traditional silicon uh, computing platforms. And this really is, um, while there are certainly some, some challenges to scaling this, and particularly the, the, the approach China took would be particularly difficult because it was literally light-based, um, this is going to hasten the arrival um, of quantum computing at scale in a commercially viable area. And given kind of how we see market happening today, my suspicion is that we would expect this to be available in a cloud basis, you know, more so than anything else, right? You know, you're not going to yeah. have a, a quantum computer, computer on your desktop, but right. you might be able to buy time on a cloud um, that has a quantum computing um, capability to it. And so this is going to really really make that worst nightmare come true where the security technology that we're relying upon, which can be vulnerable to quantum computing um, number cracking and, uh, and prime number factoring, is going to, you know, need to be sunset here sooner rather than later. DigiCert um, had a conservative estimate that said that organizations really need to have um, protections in place and plans in place for addressing quantum computing risk by 2022. So you're, you know, a couple, two or three years down the road here, it's getting real close. Really, others are putting that somewhere between, you know, five or seven years, but most everyone agrees that definitely within the next decade, you know, this is gonna be a bigger problem. And the problem that we need to address now is that <clears throat> upgrading software, upgrading systems, you know, moving off of legacy platforms that might be reliant upon uh, these types of transforms is those are projects that need to start happening now because the ability to identify where those technologies are used and have a transition plan, that takes time, it takes resources, wow. and especially in, you know, today's world, given the complexities of, you know, the pandemic and all of the focus that's been on that, it's probably been very easy for these types of things that certainly are not immediate risk to get pushed to the back burner. But given the challenges around this particular risk and mitigating it, um, it can't be left to sit idle for much longer. And even setting aside that challenge, right now you have the risk of harvesting attacks. So 
if the data that you're encrypting with, you know, RSA type algorithmic uh, processes really has a viable, useful life beyond that next, you know, two, three, five years, that data can be harvested and likely is being harvested by various nation states right now because disk space is cheap. They store it, they can crack it later and, you know, derive whatever value from that information might be available at that time. Uh, so there are some um, today concerns about harvesting attacks that really we'll see play out here um, in the coming years. The harvesting attack, I think, is something everybody needs to start thinking about. I mean, there are dates in here rounding up to 2022, which is literally a year away. Um, so, you know, all this data that's fairly recent, if they've gotten a hold of, if, if China or anybody for that fact that would work for somebody would hire somebody who would have the technology China is, is building out. Um, there's, there needs to be some talk around where has that data gone, um, even though it's currently encrypted, and how relevant is that data going to be next year? And if it is, then, then there needs to be talks around, you know, possibly protecting themselves from, from what's in that data. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, and the fact that, you know, RSA is the prime target, along with multiple encryption texts that we have going on today. Um, it's a scary thought. I mean, it's a, it's a scary thought to see somebody else finding a different way, like you said, using light, um, you know, rather than the conventional means. Absolutely. Uh, the harvesting attack question becomes really interesting when you intersect that with potential compliance or notification ramifications, because that, that it, you could literally have an organization who has data harvested today that conceivably could cease to be a going and concern over the next two, three, five years. Mm -hmm. And then that data become decrypted. And then suddenly you've got like this large pool of data out there that someone's going to be trying to figure out, okay, where did that come from? Because somebody is going to want their GDPR fine or their CCPA fine or yep. something along those lines. So then you end up with this, even if it's not your data that was intercepted for your organization, you know, how, how does this work out when you've got old legacy encrypted data um, that suddenly becomes decrypted and viable? Like who, who ends up being um, looked at um, right. for that? Who, kind of who's at fault? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, 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 there ends up being some really interesting questions that are going to be um, challenging to figure out, I think.